Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. the sixth man to walk on the moon. The Apollo 14 mission was NASA's third manned lunar landing, and the historic journey ended safely nine days later on February 9th, 1971, unquote. And as Edgar Mitchell's website goes on to say, for Mitchell, however, quote, the most extraordinary journey was yet to come, unquote. And in his book, The Way of the Explorer, an Apollo astronaut's journey through the material and mystical worlds, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, along with Dwight Williams, his co-author, really helps us understand where science and spirit meet, where matter and heaven can join, and how consciousness is one, and we're all in it. And Edgar Mitchell, thank you so much for joining us again. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. It is a pleasure of ours as well to um, have you join our audience. I think, you know, we've covered so much of what you have done at the Institute of Noah Studies and so many of the other things that people can find online at www.ions.org. If, if you could, in a sort of general way, I was rather curious. I mean, I think a lot of people are familiar with the groundbreaking work you do in consciousness as a result of your travel to the moon. Moon, but describe that experience for our audience who may not know of it. Well, the experience itself was uh, as a result of on the way home after the major work was done, successfully done on the surface, and uh, had time to play the tourist on the way back, although we still had work to do, of course, but a little more time to relax and look out the window. <clears throat> and we were oriented and rotating to keep thermal balance on the spacecraft, such that every two minutes, a uh, vision of the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, and a 360-degree panorama of the heavens uh, was visible in the the spacecraft window. And because in, in space, the stars are, because of the lack of atmosphere, atmospheric interference, the stars are uh, an order of magnitude ten times brighter than they are on Earth uh, on the clearest night on the highest mountain. And that is an awesome, awesome sight. Uh, it only comes, it's, the Hubble telescope pictures uh, or can go deeper and more detailed, but somewhere between what you see with the naked eye and what you can see with the Hubble telescope is what we could see in space. <clears throat> and it's an overwhelming experience. And I realized from my training at Harvard and MIT, uh, studying astronomy, that the molecules of my body and the molecules in the spacecraft that are my partner's bodies have been created in an ancient generation of stars because matter is created in star systems. And all of a sudden, instead of intellectual knowledge, it was visceral knowledge. It was a feeling. It was an ecstasy accompanied by ecstasy. And a totally overwhelming experience that I had no understanding of whatsoever. <clears throat> and this continued for three days on the way home when I wasn't working and had a chance to look out and uh, experience this. And it was so powerful that when I came home, I had to find out what this was all about. And of course, I found nothing in the scientific literature to describe it. 
and nothing in the religious literature, but with the help of some uh, uh, anthropologists and scientists from Rice University, <clears throat> we discovered in the Sanskrit of ancient India and a description that is where you see things with your eyes the way they physically are, but you experience them internally and viscerally as one, as a oneness, and you're connected to them. It's, it's an experience of unity. It, 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 the way you describe it almost sounds like an inner holographic consumption. Oh, exactly. That's exactly what it is. And uh, uh, that was enough to change the course of my life because for 400 years since the times of Rene Descartes and Isaac Newton and the greats of early science, <clears throat> where uh, Descartes said that body, mind, physicality, spirituality were two different realms of reality that didn't interact. We, the, the noble aspect of that was it got the Inquisition off the backs of the intellectuals of the late 16th century, so they quit burning them at the stake for disagreeing with the church. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, it sidelined all of humanity's progress, which at that point had an opportunity for a real breakthrough. Beg your pardon? I said there was this opportunity before the Inquisition for this incredible breakthrough of understanding science and spirit, and it yeah. reminds me very yeah. much of sort of the mechanistic industrial revolution overall, which ignored that which we were drawing from the earth. Exactly. <laughs> A, a question for you about your epiphany and, and when people say they have epiphanies or there's these peak experiences where, where one's consciousness is no longer ego me, but consciousness thou all. Yeah. Do you believe that it changed your biological nature itself as well? Not, not just a spiritual experience that the soul had while in the body, but did, do you think that the sensitivity the experience gave you also changed almost sort of like the neurochemical anatomy of your body? You know, I can't say that for sure. I don't know that. Um, uh it's a possibility. I've I always wondered about that because you remember Marcel Vogel's early experiments with the Bavarian water, and they yep. found, of course, water carries whatever we put into it. And so I've often thought that when a person has one of these dramatic kind of cosmic moments, why wouldn't that then be stamped inside the water of their body in the same way prayer well, or it thought is? is. And I think our mod the modern work that we've done, <clears throat> that we have done, called quantum holography, discovered just in recent years uh, helps bring that into focus and gives us a mechanism to understand why these types of things happen. And, and of course, I, I thought it interesting, and when I was reading The Way of the Explorer, I was delighted to read a little bit about your youth and growing up on a farm and that your mom wanted you to be either a preacher or a musician. And how, how do you think nature informs us in a way intellectual learning doesn't? Well, I, I think we have all of these attributes, and which one of them gets us our passion, which one of them we really get involved in, is probably uh, is probably the one that that is most suited to our individual mm -hmm. psyche, our individual makeup, and uh, that's why it says follow your bliss. I mean, mm -hmm. Bill Campbell and his great thinking of of this: follow your bliss. You uh, have to do the things that really turn you on. And somehow nature has, uh, that's what nature has done for us, is given us these, these uh, aptitudes that really make us go. And that's why we have great artists, we have great mathematicians, we have great scientists, we have great uh, musicians and who, are, who are excel, and we have great athletes and uh, Olympic uh, in the Olympic Games, but everyone has a talent that uh, they can pursue. And the more we follow those things that are uh, that really turn us on, that we're really very good at, the more we excel in what we're doing. And, and unfortunately, so often our culture doesn't let people unfold their sort of exactly. program from the exterior world of yep. what to do and what to become, rather than people being given this beautiful, golden, God-given chance to find out what their soul is here for. Well, you realized very early on that being a pilot and being in space was something you wanted to pursue, and you began, you know, at 14, I was reading, you were washing off these feather-light planes. And what is it that happened to you, just specifically, when you went into flight at a young age? Well, it was. I was intrigued because I could... Uh, 
uh, this was during World War II, the begin, er, beginning part of World War II, and I could see the aircraft in the pattern of the local Air Force Base, and I was intrigued by it. And my, I had an uncle that uh, was a pilot, at least a private pilot for fun's sake, and that wasn't a commercial pilot. And he gave me a couple of rides, and that really got me turned on. So when that, um, I had the opportunity, uh, I'd get away from work, working on the farm or my father's business, and go out to the airport. I could earn flight time by washing airplanes, and that seemed like a, a good thing to do, which I did. And I really never was planning a career in aviation nor a career in the military. It was just a... A passion. Mm-hmm. Well, it interests me that you use the word pattern, that you were looking at the flight pattern, because so much of the work that is done at the Institute of the Noetic Sciences, which you founded back in the early 1970s, deals with patterns of consciousness. Yep. Mm-hmm. And and so it, it, it just sort of, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing when you think about, when you look at people's lives and you have the cornfields and they have patterns and then you have the flight patterns and then you're looking at the way consciousness and matter have patterns. What does resonance from your estimation of things, both the description of your more remarkable experience in space that changed your life and, and what you study about how mind affects matter, what does resonance have to do with it? Well, then we... <clears throat> classical form of resonance, is, resonance is very important, you've touched on an important one. Uh, the classical form of resonance is uh, everybody's witnessed. If you pluck a violin string in the room and a similarly tuned violin string not too far away will start to vibrate. That's resonance. But the resonance is most important to us as human beings that we now discover after years of looking at this. is quantum level resonance. And um, that quantum level functions and quantum level interactions are really very basic. Let me give a couple of uh, metaphors to help get into this. All right. We call our intuition our sixth sense. Well, we should be calling it our first sense because we now know for sure it's rooted in the quantum nature of reality. And the quantum world and quantum interactions were around long before our planetary system and long before the uh, environment and the the, uh, airwaves, et cetera, that is responsible for our hearing and many of our sensory, our normal sensing mechanisms. So it should be properly called our first sense. And when we start to look at it that way, we start to learn a whole new set of uh, ideas about the deepness and the way consciousness works in ways we had never, never thought of before. Well, and of course, you know Ingo Swan quite well, as do we, and I, I remember in one of our discussions, we were talking about the suppression of what he calls bio-mind superpowers. And, and as you point out, our sixth sense is really our first sense because, gee, what would happen if we all got off, quote-unquote, the farm together and understood that, that we are both the ship and the navigator? Yep. And, and yeah, there's some pretty powerful stuff coming out of this right now. Well, it, I think it's really remarkable. What we need to do, though, is take a little break, and then maybe we can come back and talk about what's happened in these last 30 years, because I, I noticed in your introduction, well, it's actually your dedication, how many wonderful men and women you've worked with who have since passed on. And it's kind of like, in some sense, um, you represent a whole generation of guardians of spirit, in my opinion, who benefit them, people like me, who all came into this awareness. When you began the Noetic Institute, I was graduating high school, and so we benefited by your leadership, so I want to thank you. And then when we come back, I'd like to get your sort of your your view of what these last 30, 40 years have meant in the study of awareness and consciousness. Hey, I'd be glad to. That would be great. I'm Father Paul Mayer. I work for the environment, and I'm the co-founder of the Interfaith Moral Action on Climate Change, interfaithactiononclimatechange.org. And you're listening to 21st Century Radio, hosted by Dr. Zahara Hieronymus, a wonderful interviewer 
who has brilliantly supported the issue I have devoted my life to, which is climate change and healing our planet. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. Our guest is Dr. Ed Mitchell. His book, The Way of the Explorer, an Apollo astronaut's journey through the material and mystical worlds. And you can stay up to date with the institute he founded in 1972, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And they post wonderful papers if you really want to appreciate the leading edge of understanding both the relationship between spirit and science and um, I guess one would say consciousness and matter. www.ions.org. So picking up then on, on that, Ed, going back to 1972 and the fact that you had this amazing awareness that we're all made from these stars from billions of years ago, who I guess were carbon atoms and everything else, but that, but that the universe is a consciousness and we are a member of that consciousness. So when you began your work at the Institute of No Sciences and founding it, what were the primary questions you wanted to answer, or what were the primary questions you were asking? Well, and it was uh, at that point in time, the whole area of psychism and was just discounted by mainstream science. Mm-hmm. But the evidence, the evidence was overwhelming that this is it was real, powerful stuff, and whether we could explain it within science or not. Uh, we couldn't at that point, and but the fact that we couldn't uh, shouldn't detract from the fact that we're doing our best to try to find how does this stuff work, and that was what uh, was interesting me because I had uh, come to appreciate Dr. J. B. Ryan's work and that uh, others who had emulated his work, and thus uh, to me it was it was just wrong that we in science. Dispersed it. Well, and you had even carried out some experiments on your own, unbeknownst to some of the other astronauts while you were on board. And that is correct. I did do that. And it worked as well um, at the distances of the moon and back and forth as it did in the laboratory. Right. So it, it <coughs> showed you that non locality is, is a real factor in existence. And that's exactly, the, you said the right word. That is exactly what has come out, what came out of the began coming out of the modern studies 30 years ago, was that this is a non-local phenomenon, which means, in uh, lay terms, that means quantum mechanics. And even though for the most of the 20th century, physicists had denied that uh, the quantum world pertains to our scale size, to us, um, the, the dogma is that it only pertains to subatomic matter. And that's just simply wrong. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, it has, it, took, it has taken some real jarring to break that loose and to get us on a proper path. And fortunately, some work just in the last 15 years has helped to really overturn that. And that theory that I kind of alluded to a bit earlier was the discovery of quantum holography, which is a macro-scale, non-local phenomenon. You know, from the many years of interviewing men like Dr. Bill Tiller and Fred Allen Wolf and, and others whom you know and have worked with, um, the thing that interests me so much is the importance, and, uh, and our great sacred traditions have emphasized it, whether it's nativistic traditions or more traditional Sufi or Kabbalistic, um, in self-management, that the self-governed human becomes a universe unto itself and that this is really the sovereign kingdom. So when you look at what you're studying and, and what you came, because in the very beginning of your own understanding, I noticed that you asked somebody, I also had a chance to work with at one point, Dr. Bob Masters and his wife, Jean Houston. Oh, sure. and they were doing some regression yeah, work. Yeah, exactly. And, and you did that work. And, and I was kind of curious in your own journey of self-discovery, how much non-locality meaning understanding, sometimes people say, well, Zoe, you and Dr. Bob, you talk about all this far out stuff and quantum mechanics and holography and what's it have to do with me when I drive to work and I go home and I raise my kids and I pay my bills. (laughs) So if you can put that in in a frame of reference that our audience say, oh, well, this is why this is important for all of us. Well, I shall do just exactly that. Uh, But let's start with that little... uh analogy I made about the intuition being our first sense. Right. But the basis of that, this quantum holographic information structure that has been discovered, it's rooted in the fact that the discovery by Max Planck at the end of the 19th century that all matter emits 
uh, it's called black body radiation. It emits radiation. And uh, that was thought to just be random, just random emission. It turns out it's coherent. It turns out that uh, all matter has a coherent phase to it. And that is exactly what a Dr. Walter Shimp discovered when he started researching this and discovered, was working with uh, MRI machines, trying to perfect MRI machines, and he discovered this property called the quantum hologram. And uh, fortunately, it has provided enormous new insight into these types of functions that uh, are so important to us here. And it's not only our intuition that is based in the holographic formalism. It is virtually all of our sensory mechanism is tied in with this quantum function so that all of our sensory mechanism, even though it is subtle, at the mathematical level we have to use, we have to use this property to model it. And uh, it, some of it's a little too technical and mm -hmm. deep to get into this conversation. Well, it, it, what interests me is when you, in your book, The Way of the Explorer, and again, you can go to www.edmitchellapollo, and then the number 14.com, or www.ions.org to follow up after our conversation. And, and Ed Mitchell's book, The Way of the Explorer, is a new page, 2008 release. Is, as you described in the beginning of your book, when you would get into a plane, it was as if your consciousness became one with the plane. And I know from the many different people we've interviewed relative to the extraterrestrial question, um, it has been said, it is claimed that of debris fields that have been found, that there seem to be intelligences that are part of the craft themselves. And um, I wonder, <laughs> when, you, when you look at the little human being, you know, a, a vessel of its own traveling through space experience, um, whether you think that's part of our future technology, that this understanding of of the quantum mechanics of consciousness and, and science, that, there, that matter and spirit really need to be integrated, that our craft or our technologies will mu be much more integral to our mind than just outside of well, ourselves. Well, we, al we already have in, the, in some of the modern aircraft mm -hmm. uh, interactions like that, of using brain waves to help uh, understand functions and control functions. So it's not, so it's not in the distant future. It's right here on top of it. And uh, that's already a part of it. Now, you're right. There is the lower, and I don't have any personal knowledge uh, of this and haven't been privileged to be working in that area. Uh, but, but, yes, it's the so-called UFO phenomenon. And the, uh, the folks that have visited us and their machines work very much along those same lines. Now, I can't speak to that at any, any level of competence. But uh, that's what, I am, what I'm told, too. And, and so when we look out at this very delicate horizon of where we are, and as you point out, your travels in space, it, this was an advance for all of mankind, for all of Earth beings. And you said we're at a point where when we travel off planet together, we're Earth beings, which is something my husband has said since the 60s. And, and so when you then look at, I mean, your, your life is such an interesting demonstration of the journey, the solar journey, you know, of setting your mind to doing something, struggling against great odds, accomplishing it, and I think, as Dr. Larry Dalsey put it, coming back to share it, the hero's journey. But it's really the story of every human being. Yes, it is. It is, it is really uh, where we're going. We have to uh, put it in rather crass terms. You know, we have to be off this planet and out of this solar system in another billion years or so uh, for simply because it's got a life, lifetime just like everything else in the universe. And if our species is to survive, we're going to have to move on. And, okay, it's way out in the future, but those are the terms we have to be thinking in. And we've been very provincial mm -hmm. been very Earth-centered, and all of that's very important, but at some point we have to evolve past that, and that's where our future, that's where our destiny has to be. And what do you think prevents that kind of, I, I mean, it's interesting, the Rambam, a great Jewish philosopher of many centuries ago, said that the reason we lost prophecy was the lack of imagination, and that when imagination returned, we would be able to speak as one with the one. 
Well, I, I don't really agree with all of that in that I think we have, okay, we've had our setbacks, but by and large, um, we have evolved, and in the, uh, in the last 400 years, particularly in the last 100 years, we have evolved so rapidly and uh, uh, produced so much creativity and technology that it's about to overwhelm us. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've, we've gone too far the other way. Right. I tell a real quick story you know, that, uh, uh, in my talks mm-hmm. that point out that my great-grandparents went across from Georgia to West Texas at, in the 1870s after our Civil War to start a new life. And railroads weren't complete across the South and the West. And automobiles hadn't been com- invented. And electric lights hadn't been invented. And my father was born shortly after the Wright brothers flew the first flight. And I went to the moon. Mm-hmm. Now, that's from covered wagons to going to the moon in less than 100 years. And in the thousands of years before that, our transportation was on foot or horseback or cattleback or camelback or elephant or whatever. But our technology only really took off at the, be- at the near the second half of the 19th century and produced both the marbles and the problems that we're now suffering with. And we're going to have to deal with this if our species is to survive because we're not on a sustainable path at this point. Right, no, no question about it. And 21st Century Radio for the last 20 years has always focused on these issues of, of how do we, with reverence, go about living a life that's purposeful and meaningful. Exactly. And that's, we, have to, we have to simplify, we have to see the important things and have to turn ourselves around or we are in really deep trouble. You know, it often strikes me in having had the privilege of interviewing so many just maverick men and women who have had the courage to to seek and then really to find that oftentimes we're just asking the wrong questions. Part of time, that is quite true. And so when you look forward, what are the kinds of questions that we as Earth beings should be asking? What are the true deep meanings and the deep realities that are important to our survival and to our well-being? Those are the questions we need to be asking. And, and the answers that come out of that were how many new improved boxes of Tide and how many new VCRs and how many new automobiles do you need a year? Mm-hmm. In other words, what does simplicity have to do with this? It has a lot to do with it. And the point is right now that the best estimate are that our planet can sustain uh, a population of roughly 2 billion people with the lifestyle and abundance and consumption patterns of modern industrial society. And we already have four billion, uh, I mean, six and a half billion. Mm-hmm. And so something's got to give, and we have created it. We're going to have to change it. And uh, that's the problems we face. And there are many, many things that we need to be doing and must be doing if we're going to solve this. But we created it, so it's up to us to resolve it. Right, exactly. And, and, and fortunately, it's, it's come of age as sort of a, a popular movement. I know for those of us who have always been activists in environmental stewardship and right human relations, it used to be an us and them. And now, thank God, it's all of us <laughs> because yes. it really never was an us and them. And that was when we were sort of young and immature and didn't quite understand that it's all done out of love or it doesn't happen. So, so having mentioned the word love and, and you've talked about this notion of the quantum world world. Where does love fit into this as the human experience of perhaps something that's universal? I'm, I'm sorry. Is I it, said, I'm, where does love fit into it? Oh, is it, is it possible that that's the universal part in the quantum? That is exactly where we have to be, and where we have to go with all of this, for the simple reason that that is the deep connection and emotion that uh, is at the root that is going to help us solve the very problems that we're talking about. Um, We humans, uh, the the Greeks, bought the notion of agape or agape, depending on how you want to pronounce it, into the forefront uh, for 2,000 years ago as a change of heart, a change of mind, a transformational concept. And virtually all of our religious concepts are based upon this notion of a change of change of mind or a change of heart, a transformation. And 
that is really what we have to be looking at if we're going to uh, move past this uh, uh, paradox that we're caught in right now and try to resolve these problems. And the ancients have talked about it, unfortunately. I think our formal processes have obscured that transformation is really the necessary thing and that brotherhood and we're all one is really the deeper, deeper message. But some of our most radical religious concepts are denying all of that and taking it to a fight to the finish, as it were. Yeah, exactly. Precisely, precisely the wrong the wrong course. Exactly. And and so it, it takes everybody of any every in any faith to appreciate that at core it's all the same, which is supposed to be unity and and refinement and elevation and 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 yet, you know, even in our education system, that's educated out of a child. And so it seems to me, I mean, I've interviewed an awful lot of wonderful educators who are so concerned about the the mechanization of education at this point. Even even the rhythm of building things is falling out of people's hands, and instead it's all done on computers. And there's a concern that some of the modalities of human intuition, which involve the tactile sensibility and the aesthetic of, of judging and balancing is going to weaken because we're going to become so machine focused. That is quite a possibility. And, and but we have all of the um, we have all of the evidence from times past that uh, helps us understand where this comes from and how it how it can best be used. All we have to do is use modern ideas and modern tools to help uh, help grasp this idea better. Is, is there any particular area of science you think that's going to make this sort of, if one could say, a quantum leap in awareness among the academic, scientific community? Is there well, I think, you know, there's quite a few, uh, there's quite a few technologies that are very useful here. Uh, Elmer Green started some of them years ago yeah. with biofeedback. Exactly. And uh, Stanislav Grop and others have worked with holotropic breathing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a whole series of things that help us uh, get toward these areas. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the most fundamental one of all uh, has been around for centuries is the deep meditation processes that help us uh, quiet the restless mind and to... Um, get into ourselves and understand much, much better how to use these magnificent uh, uh, minds, mind bodies that uh, we inhabit. But um, we seem to have lost a lot of that. And, and it's so interesting for, for yourself and all the members around the world who benefit by the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And again, ladies and gentlemen, follow up after the program, www.ions.org, is, is that it only takes so many humans, you know, to, to, to make that shift happen. And then everybody walks down the road so easily because all the debris has been cleared away. So when we come back, if you could think Ed, for a moment, of, of when you began this amazing journey after your awareness and space of, of the oneness of, of all life, and that it's not just about even the solar system and not just about the Earth, what changed the most in your emotional makeup as a result of that? Because, I, I mean, to me, that's sort of... That, that the, is pretty vital, yeah. Yeah, that's the journey. Uh, God willing, we will all have one day. Hello, this is Dr. Raymond Moody. I am a psychiatrist and philosophy professor, and you are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zoe Hieronymus. Please listen to this program. I've been inspired by Zoe's work for many years. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. Dr. Ed Mitchell is our guest. His book is... The Way of the Explorer is really, it's, it really is about exploration and the journey all of us are on together. An Apollo astronaut's journey through the material and mystical worlds, and you can learn more at com or www.ions.org. So, Ed, going back to your experience in space when for three days you were experiencing, I guess what in the sacred traditions they often call sort of cosmic bliss, an awareness that was both having the experience and being the experiencer and witnessing the experiencer, um, what changed in you overall, constitutionally, emotionally? Uh, very simple. 
you lose the ability or the, certainly the desire, uh, I don't say the ability, we all have the ability, uh, to be violent, to be, uh, well, to be the, become the peaceful war. It's mm -hmm. a warrior. It is simply not thinkable to engage in violence because that isn't the way the universe is put together. And we have this magnificent ability to love each other. Uh, we are in all interconnected. And learning to see that and live in that way is what this is really all about. It's a, and when people say, you know, Earth is a classroom, well, the soul knows these things, and we have to sort of refine the personality, I guess, to become egoless in the meanness and in the weeness instead. When, when you look at, at the Mars opportunities ahead of us or, or the moon or others, th th turn our attention for a moment to space travel, because given that it's obvious we will be going off planet, it's both a mandate and an eventuality or um, an where do you think we'll go next? Well, obviously, we need to explore our solar system. <laughs> and we will go to Mars in due course. Um, there's you know, a lot to be done before we get there. But I like to say in my talks, when we go to Mars, right? Uh, provided we don't blow ourselves up with our stupidity before then, mm -hmm. uh, and look back at this tiny little planet called Earth, and we'll be much further away than we ever were from the moon, and this tiny little planet looks like just a little spot in the sky. It would sound kind of stupid to say oh, it came from the United States or Canada or Russia or Germany or Israel or Britain or wherever. No, we came from Earth. And we're not ready to do that yet. We haven't got our act together. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the next step. And presumably we will be able to do this in due course and be able to find ourselves and start to operate as a planetary civilization as opposed to the disjointed bunch of rebels that uh, are intent on killing each other and defining on who's got the best one. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I know um, Joseph Chilton Pierce has written a book called The Death of Religion and the Rebirth of Spirit. The title yeah. doesn't do justice really to the content, but it's really about a exactly. return to the intelligence of the heart. Yes. And so when we understand this, as you point out, by the time we do go off planet en masse, we'll be more developed, more conscious. And you said, you know, that if there are other beings visiting us, one would, one would hope, one can assume that they understand the, that all is connected. And so the thing that frustrates me, and maybe you have more patience than I do, um, though I have more than I did 10 years ago, <laughs> is, is, is when this is understood and places like the Noetic Institute or Princeton University or others through their laboratories make very clear that all consciousness is one consciousness, that we can heal at a distance, we can remote view, we can communicate without words. Why it takes so long for these understandings to translate into culture? Well, uh, Max Planck had a good saying at the end of the 19th century when we were just really starting to get uh, science and technology underway. He pointed out that uh, Progress isn't made by convincing skeptics, but funeral by funeral. And that seems to be mm -hmm. the way we learn. Mm -hmm. We don't really change the old generation because we prefer to, we prefer our ways of doing it. But mm -hmm. indeed, uh, the new generation with new ideas has to grow up and learn and do it. Do it. And that, that unfortunately, seems to be our, our fate. Our slow way. Our slow way. <laughs> the yeah. slow path, I think our dear friend, the late Christopher Bird, used to say exactly that. Either we could do too little too late, or, you know, either you're with me or you're against me. He had, he had interesting understandings, but, but the truth is he'd, he'd often say, you just got to wait till the old guard dies. <laughs> And so, there's, all, there's always an old guard around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and yet also, though, there are people like yourself. There's people like my husband or myself and my generation and others after me who, you know, we tend to be maverick. Even when we're children, we ask of questions course. you're not supposed to ask and, and do things your parents might not necessarily approve of. But it's, but it's not to be wild for the sake of anything but finding what's true. And so given that you've had this amazing lifetime of, of daring exploration, what would you say is the key to exploration? Well, the key to exploration is our, our need to go beyond, our need to continue surviving and discovering and finding out how is this universe put together. We still don't know. 
we have our theories, we have our lore, we have our all of our lessons from the past. But as far as science is concerned, uh, the more we look in the heavens and the more we get back from the Hubble telescope, the more we realize uh, how little we really know about what's out there. And um, uh, that is quite, that's, that's quite something. And uh, we have much to learn before we can really uh, get, go deep in this universe and utilize everything that's available to us. But um, we must do that in due course. Well, and, and I think as you make so clear in such a beautiful way, and I don't know who Dwight Williams is, but I'm glad that um, he is acknowledged on the on the cover as a participant in your writing of your story. I'll tell you in a minute. Oh, go ahead. You can tell us now. Well, Dwight put the uh, put the words of uh, good reading. He made he made way of explore. It was a good book, and I do well. But he put good made it good literature. And so I give him credit. For well, it, it is a wonderful book to read, and it's a great time if people are looking for really a new way of thinking about themselves and thinking about themselves in the universe, read The Way of the Explorer. It, it seems to me that, that your life not only was for yourself, I think we're all to understand that our lives are for the world. We're not just here for ourselves. And because you set up this extraordinary institute, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, it has now affected research and studies globally. Is, is there anything you see as the next step of that kind of institute? Well, uh, there are several things that need to be done, and I'm involved in doing a part of it. Uh, this whole notion of transformation, going beyond just saying the words, but understanding how to implement it, what it really means in the physiology and the neurophysiology of the brain-mind, uh, understanding that. Then the, uh, this whole approach in quantum physics and quantum holography is opening whole new, entirely new doors in research and understanding to uh, helping us understand our place in the universe and all of the, the mechanics of it much, much better. And we must pursue that because we still are just barely out of the trees when it comes to understanding the immensity and the magnificence of the universe that we're in. Very true. And and I guess for those of us that do study the spiritual traditions and... That's and, all the major part of it, right? Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm a student of Kabbalah, and I find that the Eschayim, the tree of life and its design pattern, is being a design of what they say is Adam Kadman, the first man that all of us are a template of, and that each of us, really, when we align ourselves with the magnificence of the cosmic order of things, which also includes some lunar consciousness being more attuned to the moon's phases, we sort of turn on and all those synapses that are in our spiritual anatomy that are then reflected in our physical anatomy. All of that's true, yeah. And so I, I feel that, it, to me, oftentimes, as I said to Bill Tiller, who said to me one day on a show, he goes, of course, so. You know, the universe is ten-dimensional. I said, huh, isn't that interesting? That's what Kabbalah says. <laughs> so, so there really is both an, an inner universe that is as big, I, I believe, as the external universe, mm -hmm. and, and maybe while we're doing this inner journey, it will further our outer exploration. It's all interconnected, and uh, it's all a part of the great whole and just layers and layers of interconnection. And that's what is our job to eventually understand that. Mm -hmm. Well, you do a great job of bringing it to people's awareness and I guess your interest in science and understanding how, to, how the engineering of it is is really important. Well, I think so. And when, as we can do things better the more we understand the nature of the universe that we're in. And uh, it's, much, it's much more than we've ever thought before it really is thank god for that and, and so in, in closing ed is there anything if somebody said well here you know here's the last question you can have answered or here's the last question you can ask which would it be the answer or the question well you know it's a, just a continuous process though and then and uh, we'll just have to come back and try it again if we don't have <laughs> the last answer <laughs> Well, and I, I like the way you wrote about that, you know, for that work in past life regression and whether we're actually remembering something or imagining it, it doesn't matter because it's helping us integrate information. Exactly. Yeah, it, whatever, it, whatever is reality is reality and it's mm -hmm. up to us to try to discover it. Mm -hmm. And this is all a part of that process. 
Well, you make it very simple, and to your credit, I think, you know, the the gift you bring is not only the passion you have, but also the clarity of, of your... Well, thank you very much for your... Yeah, the way you express it. Well, we really appreciate it and have always appreciated knowing you, and we're so grateful that you continue to um, take your work to the world and share it with others. Uh, praise for the way the Explorers folks is just lovely. Lynn McTaggart, who's been our guest, Dr. Larry Dawsey, Fred Allen. Well, it uh, sounds like the old club. Anyway, yeah, well, they're all friends. Yeah. Oh, no, you, it's a beautiful community, and, and that's what's so interesting. One day, Ed, we're going to be the old guard. <laughs> Getting pretty close right now, though. (laughs) Well, may you have a a wonderful evening, pleasant dreams, and may all your questions be answered. Thank you much, my dear. Thank you, too. And my best to Bob. I certainly will pass that on. Thank you all for being with us. Find out more on 21st Century Radio at www.21stcenturyradio.com. Remember that all our guest links are there. The podcasts are archived. You get more information on the different speakers around the country. And again, follow up with Ed at www.ionsions.org.